what I often tell people as well is for me, things like AI and, and Gen AI are very much a journey. Mm. Right. It very much is like a, a journey that you're going through. And so if we're talking about Gen AI, for example, it's it's OK, you're, you're interested. So how are you thinking about going through this journey? Mm. Because immediately people think about, especially in the finance realms, you know, we're taught to think about like ROI, right? Mm. Like what's going to be our, our ultimate ROI? Uh, ultimately, these things aren't going to give you an ROI the immediate next day. Right. It is very much a journey, but it's how do you put in place the right elements? elements to be able to return the best return to your business in in more ways than one mm. right hello and welcome to tech for finance where we help finance professionals leverage technology to level up their lives i'm your host adam shilton and in this episode we're speaking with jibron larabur if i've cor- pronounced that correctly uh, Chief Financial Officer at Kaleno, a receivables management platform helping businesses streamline credit control and collections with AI. With over 15 years of experience in finance, economics, and strategy consulting, including prior positions at Deloitte, Gibran has a strong track record of driving business growth. Gibran holds an MBA from Yale University and a Bachelor of Commerce from McGill University. He is passionate about leveraging technology to boost productivity and working capital for organizations. When he's not optimizing cash flow for clients, Gibran enjoys traveling, watching basketball, and spending time with his wife and three little ones. If you like what you hear today, please don't forget to subscribe to Tech Finance on your favorite podcast platform and on YouTube. But really appreciate you coming on today, uh, Gibran. Did I did pronounce your, your surname correctly, did I? Very, very close, Gibran. Very, very close, Adam. Really appreciate it. And thank you for uh, for having me on today. No, not a problem at all. No, I'm excited. And as people know by now, I'm quite passionate about, you know, these these dis- disruptive SaaS companies that are, you know, fighting for space in, in the market because, you know, these larger organizations, yeah, they've got bigger de- development teams, but sometimes, you know, they become a bit bloated and they're not innovating in the same ways as, as companies like uh, Kaleno. Um, so it would be great if you could just bring us up to speed with your, your journey to date, because I think... Um, yeah. Were you chief people officer or something like that before you became CFO? Yeah. So it'd be good to understand your journey, how you ended up Kalena, and we can go from there. Yeah, certainly. So um, studied finance and economics uh, as my, my primary background. Uh, spent a number of years in the management consulting industry um, and uh, joined Kaleno uh, about two years ago. I joined initially as uh, chief of staff, working closely with uh, the CEO helping out on a variety of different kind of strategic uh, financial and operational initiatives, uh, and then recently transitioned over to uh, chief financial officer. Um, so uh, Kaleno taking a step back, uh, we are a financial operations platform that's designed for CFOs and, and finance teams, uh, and we help them to uh, simplify and streamline their processes um, and help support them for everything from, you know, payments, uh, you know, reconciliation, receivables, payments uh, and reconciliation. Thanks for that. And, and how have you found the transition from working in more of a, I guess, a consulting type role for the likes of Deloitte? And then moving into maybe a faster paced, like SaaS type environment, what's it been like? Yeah. And so, you know, I will, I will say, I think both environments are definitely fat, fast paced in, okay. in very different, very different ways. Uh, you know, I think the, the experience at Deloitte helped provide me with a lot of the, the foundational elements. Uh, especially, you know, uh, coming out of, you know, university, you know, some quite some years ago, uh, going through getting some some base training and, and some foundational. And I think it's helped prepare me, um, you know, towards the role that I've taken, I've taken here. But I think where where the difference is, is, is um, in terms of pace of decision making, I think is, is very different, right? Uh, you know, as you go into a, a startup such as, you uh, uh, you know, Coleno, you know, we're, we're trying to really help, uh, you know, clients and, and we're trying to do things at a very kind of rapid pace, right? I'm um, trying to really innovate and, and push the envelope at a, at a very rapid pace. Uh, so I think in, in that sense, it's, it's very different. It's very exciting. Uh, and to be able to, to see something, you know, build from, from the ground up is, uh, is really exciting. It sounds really exciting. Yeah. yeah. yeah very good. And so you mentioned decision-making there. And we've, mm-hmm. we've gone off track straight away. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, 
But when you look at your work and I guess what, what the business needs from a decision-making perspective, what, what are you looking for? And obviously it's, it's different for every business, you know, whether you're a startup or SME or, or enterprise level client, but that speed of decision-making at the stage that you're at, is it a lot around sort of um, people headcount planning? Is it using data to identify um, areas of product development? What what are some of the, the, the focal points that you're discussing quite a lot at the moment? Yeah, and I, I think for us, uh, you know, the key is really uh, kind of centered around our clients and our client needs. And I think that's the element that, that we really focus on and, and where a lot of the, the decision making comes in. Um, you know, one thing that we've done, you know, very early on is is taking the time to actually sit down with our clients and, and get a better understanding of what it is that, that they need. Um, so, you know, sitting down with CFOs and finance teams and, and trying to get a real kind of in-depth of understanding of, you know, this is this is the product we're offering. You know, how does it align with kind of your needs? You know, what are exactly your needs? What do you see as your needs going into the future? And then, you know, making decisions to, you know, evolve our, our business to be able to really serve them well, um, both now and then anticipate, you know, their future needs and, and how we can evolve to, to, to be a partner, you know, through their own journey. And there's obviously, especially in a, in a SaaS business, there's a ton of data that you're potentially gathering. You know, mm-hmm. and, and forgetting about you know any of the clever stuff that you might be able to do with AI. Obviously, you need a, a decent chunk of well, you need a decent timeline to be able to do some more of that advanced prediction stuff. And and so so we don't need to go into the weeds there, and, unless of course you want to want to talk about it. But the reason that I mentioned data is the way that it plays into that decision making piece. So of course, you know, SaaS businesses that have a monthly or an annual billing cycle, you're wanting to reduce churn, right? You know, wherever you can. And it's great that you've got that active, really curious approach to your customers to be able to identify how you can evolve alongside them, which which is fabulous. But then we've also got um, day-to-day support, right? You know, mm-hmm. so, so you've got people that are maybe submitting tickets, you know, and, and all of that sort of stuff. So I guess you've, kind of got an advantage as um, a startup that's built with tech because you probably built the business with a foundation, you know, in terms of core CRM, ticketing system, finance system, that that sort of stuff. So are you in a position now where that, that sort of data is coming together to the point where that is improving your quality of decisions? Or do you think that's something that's still yet to come over time? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think as as a, as a business, you know, certainly, uh, you know, tech contributes to to a lot of, w- of what it is that uh, that we do and, and kind of helps to inform our, our decision making. You know, I would say, you know, uh, on the flip side, I think where we really try to hone in and focus is on how it can help out our our clients. And so, what do, what do I mean by that? You know, as I said, a lot of our clients are CFOs and, and finance teams in similar situations as, you know, I, I find myself in as well, you know, trying to work through the, you know, the day to day and trying to really figure out how technology and automation can really, really help them. Uh, and I think one of the key challenges, especially in, in a lot of kind of the older kind of legacy businesses is, you know, a lot of the information is kind of scattered everywhere. It's, mm. you know, it's in your emails, it's in your Excel, it's in your ERP, right? It's, it's kind of cut across different elements. So when you try to come up with, uh, you know, information to make strategic decisions as an organization, when you try to get information to make strategic decisions with your board, uh, right? Um, you know, you're trying to pull information from all these disparate sources. And so it takes a long time before you can get a clear view. And even the views that you get aren't necessarily, you know, 100% or the picture or even close to it. And so what it is that we're trying to do is, you know, how do we kind of help bring all of this data together so that you have it all in, into one place? And how do we use technology um, to help you make you know, better decisions as you go through um, and, and and utilize that data um, to be able to help uh, help you achieve your, your business objectives. So let's let's scratch into that a little bit further then, because I know um, your platform spans quite a, a, a broad range of AR related activities, right? Um, mm-hmm. Payments, collections, um, and then you've also got the analytics piece as well, right? So 
Do you want to just walk us through, I guess, some of the, the key business cases for a, for a platform like Kaleno and, and then where it slots in? Because the assumption is obviously you're going to need to have some sort of base finance system or, or ERP, right? And, mm-hmm. and I guess we're talking about the, the post-sale stage, right? So, you know, some sort of CRM that then feeds into the finance system before Kaleno can then be used for the, for the AR piece. Yeah, so so our you know our platform is uh, integrated with a number of kind of leading like accounting and ERP systems. So you know whether it's uh, you know NetSuite, QuickBooks, uh, Zero, if you're a law firm, Clio. Uh, mm-hmm. So we have a number of different integrations um, with uh, with a number of ERP and accounting systems. And so our platform is able to you know easily pull all of that information in uh, mm-hmm. and help uh, you know uh, finance teams to better manage uh, you know their. Uh, their information, you know, whether it's on the receivables, payments, reconciliation side, really uh, kind of centralize that and bring it onto the platform and help them manage it from that source of truth. Um, and then, you know, on the receivables end, for example, when a payment comes through, uh, we also have a reconciliation feature that helps, you know, to reconcile those payments and, and feeds everything back into your ERP or accounting system. Um, so that way it's it's kind of seamless for you. And so something that I've also seen when I've been obviously doing a bit of research and, and coming up to speed with your platform is this element of workflow. Yeah. So again, coming back to maybe more traditional collection type systems. Um, and again, obviously it depends on the, the level and, you know, whether it's a simple solution or a complex solution or whatever it happens to be. But the reason that workflow interests me in this, I kind of guess gives us a segue into to AI is the level of personalization that we're now able to facilitate in systems like this. Mm -hmm. So obviously example workflows could be, you know, day one, send reminder, you know, um, day two set task for a a phone call to to chase, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think we're now getting to the point where we can be very tailored with specific customers, you know, and, and, you know, what I see is the the speed of being able to offer that personalization is getting quicker and quicker with less reliance on maybe, you know, development of a, of a legacy system. So is that something that you're seeing and something that you're keen on promoting? It's something that we are seeing, and I'm, I'm actually glad you mentioned that. It's been an area that we've really heavily focused on. Uh, you know, our product team's done a great job. We've, uh, you know, recently developed these advanced kind of no code workflows mm-hmm. um, that really helps to, to enable that. And that's that's a key area for a lot of the, the, the finance teams that we serve, right, is basically, you know, how can we create, you know, these these strategies? How can we automate everything so that we can make it as effective as possible and utilize our time effectively to really focus on a lot of the high value things? Because as you know, a lot of the finance teams, the, the roles really shifted. It's become, you know, very strategic. There's a lot more demands on the finance teams, especially in, in you know, the current economic climates that we've seen over the last, you know, year or so. Uh, and so it's, you know, how do we get as, as efficient and as, as effective as possible? And how can we utilize these tools to do that? And how can we do it in a way that's very personalized, right? Mm-hmm. Um, to be able to meet the needs of of the clients that that we're serving, and so it's trying to balance those different elements. And so for us, I think workflows has been a primary area that's come up in a number of different conversations, and it's been an area that we've, you know, invested quite heavily in, into trying to produce, you know, no code workflows that are very simple to use, where you can personalize things um, and uh, and improve your outcomes. And and what so taking a step back so obviously we, we've got all of this capability that says look you know we can be as tailored or as personalized as we we need to be and obviously the, the result of that is better relationships with customers um, greater chance that they're going to pay us on time you know um, it, it, nobody wants to have you know um, a high value customer that's being annoyed shall we say or pestered shall we say, because, you know, chances are they are going to get paid, right? You know, mm-hmm. they know they're going to pay you, but they don't want to be reminded by this, you know. Th- and anyway, that, that's all right. So if somebody's thinking about implementing a tool like Kaleno and has all of this potential capability, how do you start structuring that that process? So do, is there an exercise to say, right, well, first we need to rank customers in terms of size and revenue, you know, then do we need to start breaking down in terms of um, 
poor payers versus better payers. You know, do, do you see where I'm going with this? Do you have yeah. any sort of guidance on how to set yourself up for the greater success in implementing a tool with so much capability yeah. so that your time to value is, is faster? Yeah, and, and I think that's that's what I'm learning. So, you know, there are certain, uh, you know, cases that you'll see that'll be, uh, you know, pretty pretty standard o- o- across the board. You'll have, you know, some pairs will be a little late here and there. And, and mm-hmm. reason being, you know, not everyone has, a, you know, whole finance team behind their business that's keeping track of things and things like that. And so maybe like a little nudge here, you know, can, can, uh, can help uh, kind of expedite that process. Mm-hmm. But in terms of, you know, the strategies, uh, one thing that we do do as, as customers are onboarded is, you know, our customer success team works closely with them to really understand you know, what are what, you know, what some of the historicals have been, what are some of the pain points they've been experiencing and helping them to design, you know, strategies that are really kind of tailored. So that way, you know, our clients can start off with some some recommended strategies with that foot forward Mm -hmm. um, to be able to utilize that. And then as they see those strategies play out, right, and as they get more information about, you know, how how some of their clients are, 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 are kind of performing, um, then be able to to adjust that accordingly and create you know more personalized strategies as needed. So, having super tidy data where we know exactly on average what our time to pay is isn't isn't essential. You know, it's yeah, really no, nice no. to have, but you know, it's not a prerequisite to being able to effectively use an AR. Tool. And so, uh, I would say you know the data is always important, mm-hmm. right? Having perfect data. And, and, you know, amazing data helps to improve the strategies, you know, mm-hmm. significantly, right? Mm-hmm. It helps to improve the the approach. Um, but I think, the, you know, as you know, the, the challenge is that's not always the case in every single business, mm-hmm. right? And so it's how do you utilize the information that you have now? How do you bring that all into one place, mm-hmm. right? Create a starting point, And then from that starting point, continue to iterate, continue to evolve and continue to gain better insights. And so that's what our platform enables, you know, a lot of our clients to do is, you know, whereas before all the information scattered, we help you to pull it all into one platform, mm. right? Develop those, those strategies, test those strategies out, refine it as your business evolves, as you get more information. Uh, and then once all of that information is, is consolidated, have better insights into you know, uh, what to the performances of some of your, your, your clients, the historical payments, you know, and get you better insights in terms of your future credit policies and such. So from, from a, from a cash flow forecasting perspective, um, so let's, let's take the example of zero, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. so, um, forgetting about AR for a second. So a business that doesn't have a, a snazzy, um, AR automation or, um, credit control solution like, like Kaleino, they might have a zero to, to cover the, you know, the GL core finance. And then they might have a little bit of a patchwork quilt, you know, so they, they might have like, um, I think float was one that I, I, um, was familiar with, um, when I was doing a, a more work with people using zero, which is basically, you know, cash flow forecasting tool that would plug into and, and sit alongside zero, right? <laughs> Let's say that they then take on a tool like Kaleno that has a direct impact on cash flow. What are they doing? Are they are they replacing the existing cash flow tool with the native capability and the dashboard reporting and analytics in a tool like yours, or are they still using that tool? But obviously, the business case is you know you'd be able to improve cash flow because you're being mm-hmm. paid quicker. Do, do you do you understand where mm-hmm. I'm coming from? Yeah. And so, you know, right now, you know, our, our, our systems, you know, are, are, are integrated to really complement those capabilities that mm. you'll see on like zero and, and things like that. And so, you know, I think the, the elements that we've, uh, you know, focused heavily on is, is how do we uh, provide better line of sight into that, better mm. line of sight into that cash position, right? Mm. AR being a, a huge element of that, right? The other element being being AP. Uh, you know, now as as we we think about the evolution of the business and part of the conversations we're having with with finance teams is really there's a lot of disparate solutions, right? Mm-hmm. That really focus on one element. It's very much a fragmented ecosystem in in, mm-hmm. in the finance tech stack, right? Uh, you know, you have your 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 core elements that are focused on AR, AP, payments, recon, cash forecasting, all of this stuff. So it's how do we you know help businesses the most effectively 
in being able to do that. And so what, you know, through our platform and the evolution um, that we've had, you know, it's, it's being able to, to work closely to help them improve uh, their forecasts, improve their, their overall decision-making. Uh, and then the idea, you know, as we, as we go forward is how do we kind of partner with you as you go forward to be able to, to help you improve those processes even further. Is there, is there more value to be had of a company using a more mature financial backend versus a simpler system. So obviously some, some customers will at some point start outgrowing zero QuickBooks and some of the more entry level systems and say, look, you know, we need to adopt more of our process within a, a central system, right? And obviously tools like yours will integrate with the low level systems and the, the more complex systems. Does it matter in your world? Is there still the the same value with, you know, an entry level system versus a more mature ERP system? Do you think? Yeah, I think you know we 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 work closely with with all of the different systems primarily because it really depends on the stage of the business, right? I mean, what's what's the business need if you're a, you know a smaller mid market or you know versus like a you know smaller or larger enterprise, you know you're going to have different needs, right? Your mm-hmm. accounting and your and ERP needs are going to be very different. So, you know, we've taken a, a step to really partner with with uh, you know like NetSuite, the Zero, QuickBooks, etc., to be able to to complement uh, and be able to to scale and grow with your business as you know as you see fit you know with depending on which which system Mm -hmm. um but you know taking a step back i think i I think a key element is you know it's this nature of this ecosystem right Mm -hmm. being able to build out an an ecosystem that will really help to provide you know uh consistent um kind of end-to-end pieces for for these teams i think is is fundamental and i think there's a few questions around that ecosystem and how you bring it together um but you know i think that's very dependent on the business very dependent on stage and, and things like that and i think ecosystem is the right terminology um maybe it's overdone a little bit from a a marketing perspective especially here in Mm -hmm. here in the uk um but i think i need to alter my wording um because my my default is patchwork quilt yeah which Mm -hmm. is potentially a negative uh, connotation for having multiple systems. The reason that I've um, maybe blinked is um, my experience and background is in ERP systems, as, as you know. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we've we've had those discussions before. So, I've spent the past almost ten years with the business case. You don't want separate applications. You want to bring it all into to one system, right? But that's not always the right route for for everybody. So, I think my mentality needs to shift from, well, you know, there is still a valid ecosystem approach where you will have a best of breed tool for each of these, but coming back to your point, you know, it's how, how many of those separate applications do you have, you know, and you can, you can still have an ecosystem as you, as you say, you know, um, even if you do have an ERP, you know, you mentioned NetSuite there, which is very capable, um, modular, you know, um, scalable platform, right? Mm -hmm. But there are still gaps to fill which is where the ISV market for which you, you fall into that category is, is booming for, for lack of a better term. I mean, um, I don't know whether you're familiar with the grow CFO community. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with grow? Yeah. I am, yeah. So, so um, grow CFO for people that are listening that, that haven't uh, found it yet um, is a, an online community and um, they, they provide training as well, but they've got a Slack channel um, and the Slack channel is really good because there's actually um uh, a channel there for systems yeah, mm-hmm. so, so people can say look you know this is what i'm using anybody got any recommendations for this or i'm thinking about moving to this system has anybody got experience of of this right and it, and it made me smile the other day because actually one of the conversations is on uh, received which is a uh, previous uh, pod- podcast guest roy came on and, and we had a bit of a chat on the, on the podcast as well so it made me smile um, but what I keep seeing is um, people posting saying, look, um, yeah, new, using NetSuite, but we need a, a Reverect tool, for example, you know, using NetSuite, but but need this. So I think people are slowly starting to identify areas for improvement because they are slowly coming to realize that actually it's the systems that will scale. It's not necessarily the people that scale. Mm-hmm. Not so you shouldn't employ more people, right? There's always room for, for smart people. We're not talking about replacement here. Um but it just comes back to that ecosystem point. You know, you can have an ERP, but still have an ecosystem of applications that work together. 
Yeah, and I think there's a fine balance there, right? right? And I think that's that's the point that that, that you're touching on too, right? Which is, uh, you want you want a fine balance. You want to have you know some comprehensive systems that work together really well in a really kind of integrated fashion to deliver what it is that you need. Yeah. But at the same time, you don't want you know. 30 different platforms kind of serving all of your different needs, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I think having, you know, I think in, in an ideal world, you have, you know, one massive solution that solves all of your problems, uh, you know, all, all at the same time. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, with the the, the, the realms that, that, that we're focusing on, and as you know, is just for finance teams, there are so many different challenges, mm. right? And especially as the role evolves, right? As they start to get more strategic and as the role evolves. And as the role starts to get a lot more external facing, I would say, mm. um, than, than previous. And so I think, you know, having a, a solid ecosystem with solid partners, I think, I think is key. Um, but one of the elements that we're looking at is, you know, having conversations with finance teams and, and really trying to understand, you know, uh, if you take a look at our journey from where we where we started from the AR uh, collections and AR space and then kind of our, our evolution, our evolution is really reflecting how do we become a more comprehensive uh, you know, toolbox mm. that finance teams can really rely on for different needs, right? Whether that's payments, reconciliation, receivables, management, all of those different pieces. So mm. how do we really hone in and become experts in that area and a strategic partner in, in that area? Mm. And then also work closely with our integration partners to to, to be able to um, to add value to that. And I think, I think this is where the approach you're taking is, is dead right. Because the companies that challenge finance teams to think differently and revisit their approach or learn something new are the ones that are going to be successful right and, and i think taking the sales side out of it i think sometimes people are put off by obviously marketing sales people that are trying to you know ram a ram a demo down their throat or, or whatever it happens to be but there's tremendous value when you find the right partner to evolve your business, because if you are becoming more of a tech focused business, the people with the expertise are the people that develop the tech, right? You know, so there's, mm -hmm. there are some rooms to, to be, be had there, but to go back to your previous point about the system that does everything, it does not exist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It just does not <laughs> exist. Um, the only way that you could ever come close to getting a system that covers everything is if you were to build it from the ground up. But there is a strong business case not to do that <laughs> from a scalability perspective and also from a time to value perspective. You know, you hear these horror stories of, you know, six, seven, eight figure implementations that start and never end yep. because it just then becomes a permanent evolution. You know, team members change, you know, process changes, you know, so you're trying to build a system off the back of forever changing processes. But where I'm seeing the market shifting is businesses accepting that maybe they run their business in the way that the systems are built and they mm. trust that the systems are built in a way that's actually going to provide value. There is an element of acceptance that needs to come with that or an element of, um, I won't say um, control release or something like that, but there's there's an openness and a mindset mindset shift that needs to come from that. Not to say that you should just agree with the way that all these systems work. It's why you go through an assessment process, right? You need to weigh up your options and decide what the best match is for your business. But you're never going to find a system that does 100 percent of of everything. Just just won't yeah. exist. And I and I think I think there's two elements. I think even if those those systems did exist, I think there's there's also how do you stay nimble when you to meet all the needs? You're going to have to be such a vast, you know piece and so how do you kind of stay stay nimble and, and stay responsive yeah. um and then i think the 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 second element that i would say is is you know that's one of the things that that we really try to emphasize uh, you know within our team is is how do we listen take the time to really connect and listen to our to our clients right um because sometimes you have this idea in mind this is the problem that we're solving yeah. right and then you you focus the roadmap and you develop and you, and you focus just on that piece and then you have all of these really kind of interesting pieces that come up and yeah that's that's a big problem but there's also all of these these other kind of key pieces and key elements and so being able to listen to them i think has enabled us to provide something that adds value but has you know some flexibility the mm -hmm. flexibility built in so that we can you know the idea is 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 you know as we 
we continue to evolve and, and things like that, we can really become like a plug and play toolbox, which is, you know, you have, we've got the integration with your key partner, you kind of need assistance or support with, with these kind of key areas, we can help to, to do that. And that's by building a system that's, uh, you know, fed in and developed with a lot of our kind of client input and, and user input and, and building something that is, you know, flexible and that allows, uh, you know, that that flexibility and, and that uh, that kind of specific tailorization for, for, for clients. And I think, so obviously the, the, the context that you're talking about there is um, your relationship with your customers, right? Um, from a, I guess, a, a product and a product development perspective. Um, but I think there's, there might also be an exercise for finance teams, sort of pre AR project, for example. So, so, um, and and we know that obviously everybody's got ambitions to become a better finance business partner because with the advent of AI and all of that sort of stuff, you know, we're we're wanting to show off those human skills and make our mark without being robots, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I'd. I'd hazard a guess that there's probably a lot of finance teams that don't actively approach their customers unless there's an invoice that's due, for example, or unless there's a customer query. But a recommendation might be, look, you know, do, do your 80 20, find your most valuable customers, you know, give them a call and say, look, you know, how can we make it easier for you to pay us? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You see what I mean, you know, and you might have done it already, but, you know, asking a good question might then inform the way that you set up a workflow in the in the future. You know, so we know it's pointless for these guys and sending an invoice at this time of the month because it will just end up at the bottom of the email list because their month then takes two weeks and they won't get around to payments until this time. You, you see what I mean? So maybe in, in Kaleno or equivalent tool, you say, right, well, for this customer, um, the reminder is three weeks instead of two, but at least we know that it's going to be paid on that day rather than it being swept under the rug. Do, do you see what I mean? So yeah. I think we can guess as much as we want when it comes to the way that we think is going to be the best to set up our collections process. But sometimes the path of least resistance is just asking the questions to your customers and having that open conversation. So in the same way that you're having conversations with your customers from a product development point of view, I'd say there's equal value in a finance professional speaking to one of their customers from a process development point of view and from a reducing those barriers point of view, right? Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with with that. And I think I think the other element is, you know, I think what the technology enables is, you know, uh, you can ha for you to have those conversations and then to have some data and insights really to be able to, to help supplement that. Right. Um, so that way you can utilize those conversations as a really solid base to get an understanding mm -hmm. and then be able to also have the data behind to be able to, you know, kind of complement those conversations mm -hmm. and to continue to hone, you know, your, your approach. And I think, and, I, and I'm going to draw a, a sales parallel here. And again, everybody knows that my background is in um, sales, marketing, business development, whatever it happens to be. So, um, in the sales world, and it's, it's actually very similar to collections process when you think about it, right? So, so when you approach a new prospect as part of a, a sales process, you might set up what's called a sequence, which is mm -hmm. the equivalent to, to the workflow that you're talking about in, in solutions like, like yours. Um, it's basically just a sequence of activities that happens at a certain time. Yeah. So, so step one might be initial email, you know, Introduce your, introduce your value proposition, you know, try and, you know, at least get an understanding of uh, whether there's interest there. They too might be follow up on the phone, then you might leave it a little bit longer so you don't become a pest, you know. But the reason I mention that is you might have three or four different sequences or three or four different workflows, depending on your ICP customer type, you know, who is a higher value prospect versus a, a lower value prospect. I think we're getting into this territory with that flexibility in, you know, the collections process, for example, because if you have the ability to test three or four different workflows with different communications at different stages, you might then be able to say, right, well, actually, we've had the most success in terms of on-time payments with workflow three. So mm -hmm. let's improve that and scrap the other ones, right? Mm -hmm. So... Yep. 
yeah, it just comes down to that, as you say, having the data and being able to do that, that AB testing, but it's, you know, it's yeah. the same in marketing. It's the same, same with anything, right? You know, you focus on the areas that produce and the result, it all comes down to 80, 20 at the end of the day, doesn't it? But mm -hmm. having the tools with that flexibility, assuming obviously you can run multiple workflows, of course. Yeah. 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 And, then and, and, and that's the key for, for us, you know, we've, we've got the, the, the strategies and you can really kind of tailor those strategies, you know, depending on, uh, you know, your, 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 your client or your client cluster, your, your specific client as well, and, and be able to, uh, to do that. And, you know, from that, you glean learnings from the data and insights that you get, you, you glean learnings and then you utilize that to continue to further to optimize. And, and it's like you said, you come up with, with those kind of key insights, right? Yeah. And, and, um, without detracting from the, the good work you guys are doing, because obviously there will come a time when a team does need a tool to support this because the volume of work just gets to the point where, you know, payments are late. Obviously they, they need a level of automation because otherwise they're into hiring people and, you know, um, sometimes easier to justify tech than it is more people, especially with onboarding training, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, but I guess for, for people that don't have uh, a credit, um control or, or um management system like that i guess you could do a, a soft test of the business case by um i don't know like a monday.com or something like you, you know one of those tools that allows you to at least set up a sequence of events so mm -hmm. if you are trying to trial a business case you could say right well, well we'll just use a task management or a like a basic crm tool you know i mean you know mm -hmm. a finance team could even like sign up for like a capsule crm or something like that just put the customers in and set up some tasks right but mm -hmm. if you do think that the ar automation route is the right one but you're getting pushed back to saying well i'm not sure that that's really going to lead to the results that we want you could do a soft test in terms of that sequencing and that workflow by just setting up a set of automated tasks in a free to use or basic system before mm -hmm. then being able to move on to a more mature tool because then you've you've justified the business case, right? You've got something tangible to go back and say, after we did this, we got this. Mm -hmm. Of course, with those free tools, you're not going to get the analysis. You know, you're not going to have the level of maturity and automation. You know, you're not going to have the finance specific development that's gone into, you know, your tool and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, don't spend forever in a day trying to build your own AR tool. That's not what I'm saying. But mm -hmm. <laughs> as a proof of concept, that might be a, an option for you, right? And, and I think even even beyond that, I think part of the, the, the our focus as well is, uh, you know, each business is, is unique, uh, you know, and uh, there are certainly other elements around that, um, that that are really, you know, core focus area. You know, we'll have some conversations with clients and, you know, you'll talk about late payments and collections. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, that's that's one piece of the puzzle that they're trying to solve. But, you know, the broader piece is, how, you know, how do we simplify payments? Mm -hmm. How do we simplify reconciliation? Because those are key elements, right? Mm -hmm. but from a payment perspective, you know, how do we make it as seamless and as easy as possible for our clients to, to be able to pay? Because that's, 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 you know, key barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, from a finance team perspective, you know, uh, reconciliation just takes up a consuming amount of time from mm -hmm. our business, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so it's how, you know, that, that's where we get back to, you know, what our, what our platform really allows is, is, is to kind of optimize those processes and those operations um, by helping out with with some of those kind of key key elements, right? And so it really provides that toolbox that finance teams can use. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's uh, you know we just need something to help us, you know, really kind of hone in our our tasks and our workflows, or you know, we really need something to help us with the payments reconciliation side. Mm -hmm. it, it it enables you to be able to to do those different pieces. Yeah, yeah. and that that's that's what obviously when we're moving from single use or narrow narrow use tool mm -hmm. to what you're referring to as more of a toolbox um mm -hmm. help uh, i guess a, a function within a function shall we say so uh, mm -hmm. no all good so um i appreciate that i may get in the territory of talking too much so let's um try no, and at least no, this, is, this is perfect this is great i love these conversations yeah, we'll, we'll try and at least cover some of the topics that I <laughs> so um Let's let's and I know we touched touched on it, but let's talk about um, how AI is is changing all of this. Um, and I know we spoke about it in our in our previous conversation. But what are you seeing as AI use cases in the context of AR? Mm -hmm. And so I think within the 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 AR space, I think you know where where AI is is helping out is is on a few different pieces. Um, I would say 
you know, one key element, of course, you know, we can talk about like uh, getting gaining insights from from data. Mm -hmm. uh, so really being able to utilize uh, AI to to be able to you know have the data there to help inform kind of your future credit policies mm -hmm. um, and provide you with credit uh, credit insights. Uh, you know, cash forecasting and then the like. I think one one really promising area as well, and especially when we get into, you know, the topic of, of Gen AI is, mm -hmm. you know, how do we kind of utilize um, AI tools to help optimize our, 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 our communications and our approach, you know, with our with our customers um, and as well, you know, with with our stakeholders internally, right across across the business. And so I think there's certainly some, some, some elements there. And so I would say there's a variety of different applications. You know, we talk about utilizing data to, especially around informing kind of credit insights and, and getting, uh, you know, information around, you know, credit policies and, and how do you, you know, utilize that? How do you kind of improve your, your own kind of AR management um, techniques and, and uh, forecast, you know, your own, your own cash flow? Um, but I think the the other element um, is really around, uh, you know, uh, how do we communicate all of this um, and how do we use it from a decision making perspective? And I think AI has helped to illuminate a lot of that. I think there's there's two elements to that. And apologies, have you, have you heard the screaming in the background? Oh, do not worry. I've got three of my own. So I, uh, I completely understand. Completely well, it's, understand. It's, it's Halloween today, right? Uh, uh, yes, that's true. And that in, the, true. in the UK, it's pitch black outside and coming up to six o'clock, right? So doorbell <laughs> ringing and, and all of that sort of stuff. There we go. There we go. The excitement is is uh, is coming in. Yeah, absolutely. So so um, the the mic normally does a good job of of cancelling stuff out. But if you are getting any background noise, I, I do apologise. But um, uh, no, I I have three. Like I said, I'm I'm like immune to that now. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess. We could split the AI piece, I guess, almost in, into three in those instances. So um, one that you correctly identified, you know, the, the AI piece around data, you know, how, how do we speed up that, that insight? Um, that's not particularly new, you know, um, that sort of, I guess, more, more traditional. Um, I don't think there's such a thing as legacy AI because <laughs> anyway, you know, more traditional gatherers for insights but you mentioned there that the gen ai piece and i think this is where things get interesting because as i've spoken about previously you have kind of internal use cases for gen i a gen ai and in terms of q a asking questions on data you know getting live feedback without having to rely on a person to do it assuming that obviously it's connected up to, to the right data sources right but the chat interface and you know connecting to multiple data sources is a real business case for, for gen i specifically right but then the third piece there is um, the customer facing element. And I think this is where it can be useful, but we, we need to be careful. Um, so I think it will 100% support that element of personalization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we've got a generative AI tool that understands previous interactions with customers and then it can identify, you know, better cadences of communication. It can identify, you know, um, better messaging. It can identify what is getting better responses. We just need to make sure that we're not getting into to creepy territory, right? Because, mm -hmm. again, another example from the sales world, right? There's now a plethora, and you probably get a, a ton of emails, Gibran, um, that are all I, I do, I do, yes. Really horrible, right? And there is now a prolific amount of AI tools that are, you know, doing the whole personalization at scale piece. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and I have had, you know, again, my background in sales, I'm still quite interested and I'm always open to emerging tech. And um, over the past couple of weeks, I've been looking at Gen AI, Gen, AI, Gen AI from a communication perspective. And I've always said, as I've said previously, I'll never use AI to write an email to an individual that, mm -hmm. you know, I actually want to have a, a human conversation with because, yeah. you know, if you if you think of emails in terms of actually writing a physical letter to somebody, you know, would you want a robot to write a letter and then post that on your behalf? No, I, you know, I want to have a mm -hmm. communication. Unless it's scheduling, right? Yeah, AI can schedule my meetings all day long. I don't want to do that stuff. But if I want to actually relay... Um, a message, I want to do it in my own voice rather than a, 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 an AI voice, right? But all of this personalization at scale, it will trawl through, you know, LinkedIn profiles, you know, um, and it will scrape the about, it will scrape the employment history, and it will 
it will bring up some bullshit, sorry for my language, but bring up some mm-hmm. sort of bullshit intro line um, that's, that's often referred to as an icebreaker. So anybody who gets a lot of emails, just watch out for this, right? You know, um, if it seems a bit creepy and the icebreaker seems a little bit too like it's encroaching on personal stuff that you wouldn't really expect a human to, to broach on, a, on, a, on an email, chances are it might be an AI that scrapes some data from your profile, mm-hmm. especially if it's using the language in your LinkedIn profile. Yeah. yeah, but that's that's why I say there's there's a boundary, right? Because from a collections perspective, you know, we we don't want to get to the point where Gen I is, you know, looking at a LinkedIn profile and sending an invoice to the customer and saying, oh, you know, I hope you had a, a good weekend walking the dog, <laughs> you know, and that that sort of stuff. So we have we yeah. have to temper that and make sure that the use case is still sound and that we're using it responsibly, right? A hundred percent. I think you know, and we're fully aligned with 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 that. And I think. You know where we where we see I think AI uh, uh, kind of most effectively I think is in providing at least like a steer in terms of you know the potential tonality and in terms of you know potential uh, uh, kind of written response and, and 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 things like that but it's just to suggest right yeah um, I think the human element is still core and I think in general for me in, in Gen AI. I think the human element is still, you know, fundamental, right? Yeah. Especially when you're talking about um, finance and in the finance realm, when you start talking about things like, you know, data privacy, data quality, uh, you know, bias and algorithms, like you start to talk about all of these different elements. I think really having that that human element is, is key. And I, and I also think in terms of like data output, data quality and, and, and things like that. So, you know, I think for, for me, the Gen AI has, has, has a lot of, interesting opportunities and interesting applications. I think the human element is still, you know, uh, and the judgment element is still a, a key component uh, of that. But I think, yeah, I 100% agree. You know, we, we need to get the balance, right? You know, we need yeah. to use the bots for the stuff that they're good at, and then we need to use the humans for the stuff that they're good at, right? But I think, and it's, it's just come as we've spoken around, you know, um, personalization in, in email communication specifically, right? So. Mm-hmm. Um, let's say that you've got an email address that you use um, and you might get an automated reminder from a tool like Kalena, for example. So it could be um, like payments at company or it could be accounts at company or whatever. Um, but it could be that you're not hiding that it's automated, right? You know, so, so, mm-hmm. so maybe when you onboard the customer, you say something like, oh, just to let you know, you know, we use an AI, a- AR tool. Um, a lot of that is bot driven, um, but it's just to help you understand what you owe us and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. It's not from a, we don't want to speak to you. It's just to allow you to have a seamless experience when you're making payments to us, for example. There's a gap there if people know that they're speaking to a bot that that bot can be useful both to you and the customer, right? So going back to what we said previously about, um, you know, the finance teams approaching a customer to say, look, how do we make this payment experience better for you? You know, how, how would we help you pay us quicker, essentially, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Gen, I, Gen AI could do that if it's got access to the data, right? So, so, so <laughs> if a customer goes overdue for the third time in a row, it might be a flag there because the AI's got access to the data, right? And maybe the next reminder, what goes out in the email is, hey, look, you know, this is another reminder. Sorry, you know, but it's my job to chase. Um, Just so you know, your last two payments to us were late. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we can do? So Mm -hmm. so you've got that halfway house. You've not got a human phoning the customer to say, how do we improve this payment process? But you've kind of got, a starting point for a conversation that is yeah. then getting that feedback without somebody having to, you know, spend their life on the phone. So I think that's that's where yeah. we're starting to get really and, interesting. And I right? think even even the balance, I think, in, and that goes back to the strategies and the workflows and things like that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, is 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 that, that human element that really gets to understand is, as you said, you know, they know their customers, they've had the conversations with the customers, what works best, what's the best, you know, kind of messaging. So you utilize these the the tools to help to help complement you know, those, those, those kind of key pieces and to help automate and simplify processes. Um, but there is that human element of really, you know, understanding, you know, your, your clients and, and things like that. So it's, it, it's, as you said, it's, it's, it's a balance. 
I, I could go into a whole rabbit hole now. Like, you know, <laughs> from, a data, from a data capture perspective, yeah. you know, um, if you've got a bot sort of, and, and, and it had to, as we say, it had, had to be done in balance because you don't want every email to be followed with a survey on it. Oh, is this your preference? Or how would you rate this? You know, one's five. And in all honesty, you know, I know it's good feedback, but I, I never respond to the surveys. You know, when I get asked, mm-hmm. you know, would you rate this out of five? Maybe I should, you know, maybe I should do the, the good thing and help, you know, people make those data-driven decisions, but, but ho-hum. But yeah, we could go down a, a whole AI rabbit hole i guess oh yeah yeah no i i I could do the same (laughs) yeah but um we we can save that for a round two so i I guess one of the things that i'm trying to promote a little bit more and and this was kind of seeded by anders um a couple of podcasts ago so anders lou Lindbergh, who um everybody knows because he's got massive following massive newsletter and i had the privilege of of guesting on one of his one of his podcasts not not too long ago which which is fabulous great experience and a bit of a you know one of those pinch me moments Mm -hmm. um but his finance 5.0 revolves around putting the human back into um technology And, and i know you've you've mentioned this in terms of making sure that we are not forgetting that there is still a human as part of this and that we can't just have a completely automated tech driven approach that there, there needs to be a balance there. So what are your views on maybe the stuff that we need to focus on as people once we've automated some of the, the tech stuff, mm-hmm. Obviously we've touched on some of the decision stuff, but what do you see as the, the quickest wins in becoming more human once you've solved the automation problem? <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that one is, you know, taking a step back, I think that one is a bit more challenging to kind of give a, a, a broader answer. And the reason I say that is because I think for, for every business and for every industry, it'll really revolve around a few different pieces. I think where we see a lot of these items fail, and, and I think, you, you know, you recently had a conversation around that is the, the implementation, right? Mm, yeah. um, if you go into the implementation and it's not focused. Mm. And so for me, it really is, you know, taking a step back to really try to understand everything back to the vision. What is it that we're trying to do? within the organization what is it we're trying to do as we as we look forward what's our vision what's our actual strategy right mm-hmm. once you actually have those things in in place right getting an understanding of okay what are the some of the the uh, operational elements and the capabilities that we need to be able to to complement that mm-hmm. right um, and then i think once you actually have those those kind of clear elements like a very clear strategy, very clear vision, clear strategy, clear understanding of what those kind of core capabilities are that you need, what are some of the core systems and, and processes and, and things like that. I think once you set those those elements up, then you can start to really get an understanding of what what that starts to, to look like and what that human element is as you, as you go through, right? Um, because I think for each business, it, it is very uh, kind of unique. Um, but I think, you know, it really is starting up front and, and that in itself is, is a human element is, you know, creating the, the, I guess, blueprint or the architecture to be able to, to take a step back and say, you know, what is it that we're trying to do? Uh, what is it that, that we need? Uh, how is it going to complement our, our business? Um, and what are the capabilities that we need? And, and what is the upskilling and, and talent that we need to be able to, to do that? And I think, so I'm glad you mentioned upskilling and talent because there was um, stuff whirling around in my head as, as you were speaking that relating to how do we make the most out of the the people? Yeah, and, and you correctly identified that, you know, you know, there's no such thing as people in isolation. There's no such thing as systems in isolation. You know, um, it all has to work together, right? But, and, and I'll use an example of a recent, right? So, so um, our finance team, Mm-hmm. Um, combination of people with a, a tremendous amount of experience, um, but also youngsters that are creative, um, willing to you know focus on on the the business partnering stuff because they're not yet overwhelmed by all the repeat stuff. <laughs> do, do, do you know what I mean? And yeah. um, we've given them, I won't say free reign, but we've encouraged that that creativity to the point where they've gone off and built Power BI dashboards, for example, off their, their own back, you know, without needing a, you know, really intricate brief or being told what to do. So they've, they've sort of sought out that stuff. And then today, um, 
I had some some data from that same individual saying, oh, hey, you know, just just thought it might be useful for you to know that, you know, here's some analysis of the recent customer acquisitions we've had in terms of company size, uh, founded dates, all of that sort of stuff. And they didn't need to do that. They're, they're taking the initiative, right? So I'm wondering whether, and I think a lot of people will do this already, right, is, you know, we've got our desired state when it comes to systems automation, the stuff that we don't want to do because it's just a load of headache. But then do we also have like, a, I guess, a skills matrix for lack of a better term, but not not in terms of just hard skills, right? Um, in terms of, oh, you know, can you um, produce, uh, you know, p &L, you know, from the system or, you know, can you, you know, produce a three-way model and all that sort of, I guess, more, more technical stuff. But also, also from a soft skill, you know, what are your unique strengths? And I suppose it ties back to that personalization piece as well. We want to have technology in place so that we can flex to the individual strengths of the people that we've got on the team mm -hmm. as opposed to just expecting them to to be human robots right yeah and for and for me that 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 really goes back to i think the the leadership and the 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 vision the strategy and the culture that's set by by the leadership team and that permeates down mm. right um i think having a very clear vision like this is where we want to go a very clear a clear strategy but as part of that strategy it's going to be there's going to be a very set roadmap for certain things that we want to develop but within that we want to embed enough flexibility to enable you know and empower our people to be able to go out and create these 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 creative elements so i think there has to be some sort of uh, in my view there has to be some sort of sense of direction but there also has to be a a, a culture element around you know, how do we get about get get to this point? Mm -hmm. I think part of it is going to be sure some of the, the, the key elements that we have on the roadmap, but there's going to be a, a culture around continuing to to challenge that and trying to think through new and creative ways, right? Understanding where it is that we want and need to go as a business. It, it's, so, it's so difficult, though, isn't it? And again, I'll, I'll draw the comparison between, you know, um, scrappy startup and, um bloated um, and enterprise, you, you, you see what I'm saying, right? You know, that, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm wrong in generalizing here. Yeah. You know, because not every enterprise level organization is boring and stuffy, you know, not every startup is, you know, scrappy and creative, you know, so, so again, take, take that with a pinch of salt, but my experience is that, you know, the, the culture is what sits behind the startup organizations that are most successful. Yeah. Yes. Um, Google, for example, I mean, you hear the stories about, you know, the bean bags and the, you know, the, the day offs to basically do whatever creative pursuit that you wanted to do. And, you know, all, all of that, that sort of stuff. But I don't think that that limits larger organizations from instilling that, that culture. It, start, it starts with the people. But the reason I say it's difficult is let's take a simple example, like um, upskilling. So um, I know plenty of businesses, um, ours included, that have um, online e-learning platforms that they offer as part of the, the package, right? You know, so um, yeah, as, you know, you work from Think, you get access to our library that's got endless resources that relate to basically anything, whether it's a video course or a book or whatever. So fill your boots, you know, you can do that. People don't do it, mm -hmm. you know, um, so there's obviously people on the leaderboard, obviously the people that are voracious learners, right? They're thinking, well, I've got a free learning platform. I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to jump into that and, and I'll smash it. Right. But I think that's where it's tricky because you don't want to be the enforcers because that's when the culture breaks. You, know, you don't, you don't want to say you have to do X amount of hours in terms of L and D, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you want to, you want to encourage people, right? You know, and that's, I think that's, that's the tricky bit is, is getting that balance between the enforcement and the encouragement that I see a lot of businesses struggle with, I guess. And the, the people and culture is, yeah. is, is, is a challenging one. I think from a, from a larger organization, if you've got a, a culture that's very well entrenched and not necessarily kind of adjusted to where it is that you want to go currently it's how do you kind of shift that that culture there's a lot of challenges you know to, to to be able to do that and then as a startup it's how do you kind of build the right culture that you want to to build i think you you hit the 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 nail on the head i think 
culture um, is is a culture and people will make or break your business. And I think especially in, in, in this environment where, you know, you have a lot of people who will be willing to take the initiative. It's easy access to access a lot of training. You have, you know, a lot of people that are willing to go in and, and jump in and teach themselves and learn and, and to push themselves and in, 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 in help advance your business. How do you kind of promote that? How do you do, you know, those, those kinds of pieces? I think that's, that's definitely, you know, a, a challenge is definitely something that we strive for. And I think, you know, part of the, the, the element, at least talking from our own perspective at Kaleno, one of the things is, you know, we really put an emphasis on people and culture. And that's something that we look for, you know, right off the bat is how do you make sure that you get the right people that have that inquisitive nature, that have that, you know, desire to, to kind of go and, and push the envelope and try out new things and teach themselves and, and go in and, and try to try to push that. Um, I think there's a lot of, especially, you know, as we go in right now and, and, uh, and then the time that we have the, the, there's a lot of opportunity uh, and it's, it's how do you kind of take advantage of that within your organization and how do you inspire your people to do that? And that is a tougher nut to crack. Yeah. Inspire is a good word there. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, c coming back to, you know, the finding good people, you know, that's, that's, that's a challenge in itself. You know, how, how do you, how do you find the people that are intrinsically motivated? You know, um, I had, um, a guy, a guy called, uh, Craig on the podcast. Um, can't remember what episode it was, but he works for a scrappy startup called Arctic mm -hmm. Shores. Um, and they do, um, basically a very tech driven HR assessment platform. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and their value prop is it's impossible to understand the characteristics of a human from a CV alone, you know? So, mm -hmm. and the example they always give is, you know, um, they placed um, a former McDonald's manager at a very large insurance firm when on paper it made no logical sense, but from an EQ and from a skills perspective, you know, it was, it was a, it was a perfect fit, right? You know, yeah. and, and that's, that's tricky. And, you know, you can read as many books as you like, um, but as they say, it's, it's only, it's only time spent doing the doing that actually informs these decisions. Right. So when, when I look at myself from when I first started giving interviews to, to now, my approach is, is completely different. So I listen to my gut a lot more now when I'm mm -hmm. speaking with people and that, you know, may seem counterintuitive to somebody who talks about, you know, tech and one of the zeros with them all that sort of stuff as well. But I think a lot of your brain is connected to your gut without getting to, you know, um, into the weeds there, but I've learned to trust that instinct a little bit more. And a lot of the pointers go towards that, you know, if I were to start a founding team again, would I want them as part of that founding team? You know, and, and mm -hmm. I can't remember who it was, um, Tim Ferriss guest from, from ages ago. And again, forgive my language here, but, um, the guiding principle for their hiring process was, you know, if it's not a fuck, yes, it's a, it's a no, right. You know, mm -hmm. um, but it's difficult, you know, and, and it's becoming easier because you don't need as much talent if you've got the tech that, you know, fills some of the, the slack, right? Mm -hmm. But you still need the good people to leverage the tech so that you can, you can drive the business forwards, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's why, you know, we've taken a lot of time. We've, we've built our team and, and we've taken a lot of time to really invest. And I think we built a, a really, um, well, I'm biased, but I think we built a really great team. Mm. Um, but that's also because we've taken a lot of time to really try and identify, you know, what is it that, what are the characteristics that we're looking for? What are the key skill sets? You know, what is, what is everyone bringing together? How does that all complement? And that is a huge element. Um, and, uh, it's been a huge element to, to our team, our, our, our growth and, and, you know, our, uh, our trajectory as we go forward, definitely an area that we invest a lot of time in. Um, and I think we've, we've been able to build a good team so far. And, and how do you, as you continue to scale, how do you continue to propel that? Right. The, the thing that is difficult though, because employees come and go, it's a fact of life, right? You know, um, so we can't get too bent out of shape about it. You know, I think sometimes we see it as, um, maybe too personal when somebody leaves, but it's not that, you know, there's so many factors, mm -hmm. you know, it could be money. It could be, you know, they want to move into a new industry, you know, fill in the gap. Right. Um, but a recommendation that I will make as much as it hurts is if you have a gap in resource where they're actually quite integral, that it's a position that you really need to fill, try and manage by yourself until you do get the perfect fit. Because if you try and 
higher out of necessity, you can actually end up doing more damage than if you'd held off and just, you know, sort of grinned and, and yeah. bared it for a while. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and as I say, it's, it's difficult because it potentially means that you end up spending more time, you know, or you've got to spin more plates or other stuff that you want to do gets pushed off the priority list. But, you know, as I say, holding off for that right person is going to pay dividends in comparison to hiring somebody who's not fit for purpose um, that could cause more problems than they solve. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a hundred percent in agreement. So, so, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. So just going back to, to the culture piece, you, you've kind of seen things from both ends of the spectrum, right? So, you know, obviously mm-hmm. Deloitte's a, a massive organization, right? And now you've gone into, you know, building the founding team of, of what is no doubt going to be a really successful company. You know, how, how have you, how have you found that culturally? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's uh, you know there there are certainly uh, certain differences certainly as as you go into into the organization, uh, you know I would say you know one thing is and and I have you know tremendous uh, you know great things to say about Deloitte and the, and the leadership team that I had here you know at, at the firm, uh, and I think you know they were doing you know great kind of efforts to. Uh, you know, build in some of the those those capabilities and and to to evolve the culture, right? To be able to do that, and they did they did it with 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 you know, in my view, success for for that scale of an organization. Hmm. I think the the challenge on the flip side is as you're going into into a startup is is how do you you're creating a culture from ground up, hmm. and so it's how do you create the right culture. Hmm how do you create a culture that can evolve and scale mm. um and and uh, how do you make sure um that the culture that you're building is setting the right foundations for where you need to where you need to go mm. um and so i think that's that's key um and so i think you know our, our ceo and uh and uh, our cto the co-founders of the company you know have helped to to kind of lay down you know some of the, the key elements that they're, that they're looking for and i think we've tried to you know bring on team members that are aligned to that and that are helping to evolve and enhance our culture right um as uh, as we go forward but i think it's 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 a completely different uh, at least for me, it was a completely different perspective coming in from, you know, an, an organization that had a really well-established culture where you're, you're continuing to evolve that to coming in where, you know, you're one of the first employees and you're starting to build that culture. And so you start to ask yourself all of these questions about how do you make sure that you're building, you know, the right elements and the right culture and how do you enforce that culture? How do you make sure you bring in people that that, that are aligned with that culture? Um, so it just brings in, you know, a new set of perspectives, new set of questions and, and, and things like that, that you need to really seriously think through. But I think that culture element often, you know, culture gets underestimated, I find in a lot of conversations, it very much is like, you know, we just need to focus on the, you know, this is the strategy, this is how we implement, but the, the people element, the change management element, the culture element, I think those are, are, are key, you know, core elements that can make or break any initiative, any business and any initiative, to be honest. How how are you doing for time, Gibran? I've, I just realized that we've gone I am minutes over. I'm loving this conversation perfectly fine. So, you know, you, you let me know what uh, what works. Fine. So, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep going for the, for the next 15 minutes or so. Because our, yeah, yeah, yeah. And is this is this working for you, getting you what, what it is? That, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, all perfect. good. Yeah, all good. So, Great. Um, stay, staying with Deloitte then, um, and again, you, you don't have to answer this question, but um, are there any frameworks um anything that you picked up in terms of your approach and the way things worked there that you think would be useful to to finance teams to inform their decision making either from a transformation perspective or from a just day-to-day process perspective Mm -hmm. yeah and i think i think that comes back to a lot of the core elements that that we talked about which is you know uh, as you're going through any real transformation effort, just taking a step back and taking a bit of time to really think through what it is that you're trying to do. Because I think there's almost this this push. I, I find that there's, 
you know, certain elements, and it's not just contained to finance teams, but other teams as well, which is, you know, uh, two kind of sides of things. We want to jump in right immediately because there's a lot of stuff happening in the AI and Gen AI space. So let's let's just jump right in. Um, and then there's the other side, which is like, oh, you know, we want to take a little more time. You know, we want to uh, kind of take our time. We don't fully understand it and all of these elements. And so one side risks kind of jumping in without a clear strategy, having all of these disparate kind of pieces and not necessarily achieving the results that they want. Um, you know, the other side, you know, risks the potential of kind of falling behind, you know, as they as they don't. And so I think taking a very, my perspective is taking a very kind of measured approach and really taking the time to think through, you know, the vision, the strategy, uh, the culture and people element, the capabilities piece that you need, I think up front um, is really fundamental to, you know, kind of longer, longer term success. And so I think, you know, taking that little extra time up front to do that, um, I think uh, for for those who are hesitant to jump right in, it, it helps to provide, you know, kind of like a clear path of in terms of like, where is it that you can potentially start to test test things out? For those that are thinking about jumping in, it provides a kind of a clear structure and, and helps you get aligned around what it is that you're trying to do and, and aligned across the organization. And so I think those are two elements. And I think my experience at Deloitte really helped me to really understand what that process looks like, right? As you're sitting around the table, mm. um, how do you make sure that you go through and, and get the right key elements in place up front as, as you're going through to help success, um, help ensure success as you go down into the implementation? Mm. I think, so the thing that I've been battling with, um, and I did a post today actually, got quite a lot of support because I, I, I tend to be quite vocal about the times where I struggled and start burning out. And and We saw that post, by the way, earlier today. That was a great post. Yeah, so um, th thank you. Yeah, and, and you know, so somebody's got to say it, right? You know, the, mm -hmm. so, social media can't just be a place where everybody's, you know, saying you know how many subscribers they've got to their newsletter and you know how much revenue they've done in their bit you know all of that sort of stuff and i'm not saying there's not place for it because obviously we should celebrate success but it's very fatiguing to the people that do struggle not to see any stories from people that are maybe going through through something similar right so for me and and i'm getting to the point now where i actually i'm, I'm inclined to think that there's not such there's no such thing as burnout. Um, and I'm going to re-comment on the post, actually, because I missed out a, a crucial part because it actually relates to um, a podcast I listened to by a guy called Andrew Huberman. Have you heard mm -hmm. of Huberman? Stanford, no, Stanford, no, I haven't. No, Stanford I University professor, uh, professor. He does a podcast called Human Huberman Lab. Mm -hmm. um, and he's amazing. He's got a great voice. Um very into his fitness, but also incredibly smart. So some of his podcasts are two hours and they generally follow the format of the first half is the scientific research that goes into the topic that he's discussing. And then the second half is generally the actionable tools that have come out of that research that can help you. And it's all predominantly to do around um, your brain um, on concepts like dopamine, hence part mm -hmm. of the uh, inspiration for the post, stress management, you know, all, all of that sort of stuff, anything that has some sort of neural um, setting, I guess. Um, but the reason why I'm now inclined to say that burnout doesn't exist, but dopamine deficits definitely exist is if you look after yourself and ensure that you're getting adequate amounts of sleep, um, that you're resting and digesting, that you're eating the right things, providing there's a level of enjoyment behind what you do, you could mm -hmm. potentially keep going forever in a day without experiencing any sort of burnout because you're living in balance, right? I think the term burnout is sometimes misattributed to something that was banded about called adrenal fatigue or something like that. And, and again, there's not really any research that supports the concept of physical adrenal f fatigue, even though sometimes it may, may feel like it, but it comes down to that. If you do the right things to support the production of the right hormones, then you can keep going. Right. But the mistake I made is sacrificing the, sacrificing the, the rest and reset, in favor of just getting the next thing done. 
you know, and, and I know we've gone on a bit of a tangent, but it ties to what you're saying from a taking a step back and, and looking at things point of view is that, you know, are we just trying to do the next thing because we think we should be doing the next thing? Or is this next thing something that is grounded in logic and something that is sustainable? I, is it something that's going to stand the test of time or is it just something short term that we're going to have to fix or change within within a month? And that's yeah. where my thinking has evolved from being on the bleeding edge. And don't get me wrong, I love having these conversations and I love talking about emerging tech and, and I love all of these sorts of things. But in terms of the content that I produce, I don't want every post that comes out, I don't want every conversation to solely focus on what's going on in tech this week, even though I've got some ideas about like a This Week in Tech podcast, but that's, that's a conversation for for another day, right? But what is evergreen? What is sustainable? You know, what can people keep going back to? You know, you know what what is the value? So we take our conversation as an example. Yes, we've spoken about te uh, tech, but a lot of the principles that we're talking about in this conversation are evergreen. So people can keep coming back to this, right? And I think it's the same in, in business. You know, if you want to build a successful business, you need to know that what you are building is sustainable. And that starts with those micro decisions about the longevity of whatever you decide to, to take on next, right? So sorry, I've, I've done a bit of a monologue there. No, got me no, no, that, <laughs> that, that, makes, that makes complete sense. And I think it, it goes back to that human touch, yeah. a human touch element that we talked about earlier, right? right? Um, and, and I think that that piece is, is fundamental in, in all aspects. Right. And so I think, uh, I think it's, it's key and, and I agree with you. I think taking the time to really think through how do we do this and how do we do it in a sustainable way in the most effective way, right. Um, in the most clear path, I think is, is key. You might have to ex accept the yeah, short term you might miss out on a couple of customers that are really wanting like the bleeding edge stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But are you potentially stripping the long-term potential revenue from having doubled down in, in other areas? Yeah. And I think what, 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 to, what the, the, the thing I often tell people as well is for me, um, things like AI and, and Gen AI are very much a journey. Mm -hmm right? It very much is like a, a journey that you're going through. And so it's, you know, if, if we're talking about Gen AI, for example, it's, it's okay, you're, you're interested. So how do you, how are you thinking about going through this, this journey, mm -hmm. right? Um, because immediately people think about, especially in the finance realms, you know, we're taught to think about like ROI, mm -hmm. right? Like what's going to be our, our ultimate ROI? Uh, ultimately, you know, these things aren't going to give you an ROI, the immediate next day, right? It is very much a journey, but it's how do you put in place the right elements to be able to return the best, um, return to your business in, in more ways than one, mm. right? Um, sure, in terms of an, an, an efficiency and a productivity and, and a key element, I think those are, are fundamental elements, right? In terms of allowing your employees to focus on, on the value added activities, allowing them to focus on, you know, health and wellness and, and, and other key pieces. Um, but I think it's also situating your business for, you know, the longer term. Um, and I think that enables you to, to, to have a more kind of holistic view when you're talking about ROI is thinking it, thinking of it from a very much a journey perspective, um, that being able to set out at the beginning where it is that you're, you're planning to go, having a very kind of clear vision, um, you know, clear path towards that. Um, and then, you know, it allows you to be able to take the steps to get to where you need to be. And so, yeah, that'll take longer than, you know, maybe throwing in everything, you know, all at once and trying different things all, you know, within the next few weeks. But ultimately, I think your uh, longevity, your success and your sustainability is is much better um, taking that that more measured approach. And speaking from personal experience, because everybody knows, like I'm an advocate of signing up to every trial that exists for every you know, Gen I product that's released because it's in my nature. Um, or at least it's, it's now become part of my, my nature, even though sometimes it's a bit fatiguing, right? But I see a massive, there's a massive variance in good versus bad. Mm -hmm. So I find that in a lot of instances, the 
products that are developed with generative AI at the core. I had a very interesting conversation with uh, Jamie Lee Salazar at um, uh, Cobbler. Sorry, the, the name always escapes me and it's getting late. So, so sorry, Jamie, for, <laughs> no. Jamie Lee for pausing there. Um, but yeah, so, so Cobbler, but that's, that's built around AI, right? Um, to automate the production of informed data. Yeah, so, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's great and that's a really good tool. There are some that are ill-conceived that come back to that. Oh, you know, Gen AI, Gen AI is in at the moment. We just need to get something out because it's a money-making exercise. And yeah, it's not going to be forever, but we'll just, you know, market it and get, get it out right. But what I'm also finding now is there's also a massive variance in the quality of the generative AI that's being built into the platforms that we use already, right? So mm -hmm. coming back to podcasting, Every podcast platform now seems to have some sort of um, generative AI flair that's been added to it, right? So um, Riverside, and I'm, I'm not going to, mm -hmm. we're recording on Riverside now. It's a great mm -hmm. platform. Um, what they've released is something called um, AI Clips or Magic Clips or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, that will essentially trawl through the transcripts and try and pick out the 10 second shorts. And it's all done from a posting a YouTube short perspective on the most interesting parts of the conversation. Mm -hmm. But they're good, but they're not great. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so actually, when I look at sifting through the 12 magic clips that is created for me, compared to me actually going through the transcript and looking for the language that I know hits the right emotional points it's actually quicker for me to do it myself than it is to sift through all of those magic clips right yep. it's the same with um, some of the other transcript tools that, that i've used um, that have like an add-on for generative ai where you can chat to the transcript right the majority of instances it's, it's very poor right and and i and i often feel like you know if you'd taken or if that company had taken a step back and just paused for two weeks a month you know, spent just a little bit of extra time really understanding what the end goal is of that, as opposed to just chucking it in, they'd be reducing churn, they'd be improving customer satisfaction, and they'd be helping more people. You see what I mean? I think acting too quickly is sometimes ill-conceived and it doesn't help anyone. Um, it doesn't help your revenue and it definitely doesn't help your customers. So anyway, rant over. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. I think uh, there, there's a fine balance. You know, I think it, it's good to have a clear, it's good to, you know, I think the, 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 the concept of, you know, trying new things, failing fast and learning, I think is, is great. I think taking us just a little more time to think through cohesively, what does all of this look like for us, I think is, uh, is valuable as, as you're going through. And I think that's where you'll get the most, the most success, the most ROI, the most return to your business, the greatest sustainability, um, and the greatest longevity. Totally different. Um, but I will mention it now it's on, on my mind. So have you watched big vape, the rise and fall of jewel yet? Jewel. Yes, I did. I watched that over the weekend. Yeah. So scary, really good story mm -hmm. in terms of. Yeah, so, so there's some good stuff in there about failing fast, but also balanced by some really bad stuff about yeah. maybe the unorthodox approaches they took, taking it to, because they basically, and again, I don't know the facts, but it was presented as though they basically got every teen in America hooked on vaping, right? You know, because they, they made yeah. the iPod of, of vaping or whatever. But the, the reason I mention that is because key as part of that is the, you know, fail fast which was, you know, you don't want to fail fast with dangerous substances is the, is the takeaway there. So there is a, there's a parallel, right? You know, we're not talking about something that's super dangerous in the same way that addicting people to nicotine are, right? But to a lesser extent, sometimes failing fast can have negative consequences on the people that you're trying to help. Yep. 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 That's why I always say it's fail fast with a little asterisk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I've only got two more questions for you, Jabron. I yeah, really appreciate the extra time that, that you've taken today. Oh, this is great. Really enjoyed it. So when you look at your journey, um, you've very eloquently put, you know, look at the journey of, of uh, where, where you're going, but, but your journey, where has technology helped you the most, whether it's, saving you time, helping you make decisions. Are there any particular points where technology has really helped you either in an individual or a personal sense? 
Yeah, I would say uh, for me, technology has, you know, I can, I, I think save time and, and all those elements, you know, I, I would point to, but I, I feel like the, you know, those for me are, are, are pretty standard across. I think for me where it's, technology has helped to expand my horizons and, and illuminate new things to me. Hmm. As someone who kind of really seeks out knowledge, I think being able to utilize uh, technology to help expand my own knowledge, challenge my own thinking, I think that has been very much key. Um, so yes, it saved me, you know, a lot of time and, and, and done things like that. But, you know, being able to utilize technology to really expand my horizons, uh, understand things better, uh, you know, try out new things that, you know, I, I wouldn't have, have, have thought before, you know, expand my horizons. I think that's where uh, it, it goes. And so I guess, you know, long winded answer, but I would say it's, it's, it's really kind of expanding my horizons and illuminating new things um, that I was, I was unaware of, you know, previously, um, you know, are we, are, are we just talking like broadly there in terms of access to information, like, um, Google search and, and that sort of stuff, or are you thinking more specific, like research tools or, or, or that sort of thing? Yeah, I would say, you know, I, I would say it's, it's, it's sure it's, it's, it's platforms like, uh, you know, having platforms like a, a Google and, and, and things like that. But I think even things like, you know, chat GPT, mm -hmm. being able to use chat GPT to, you know, sometimes go in and get a basic fundamental understanding of basic concepts, right. Mm -hmm. Um, that then helps me to expand out. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, what I, whenever I have a, a new topic that's, that's brought up to me, you know, what I'll often do is I'll go on to chat GPT and I'll say, you know, okay, how can I get some of the fundamental questions that I want to answer? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And that provides me with a base that I can then use to go on further and, and investigate and, and, and things like that. So for me, I think that's where I found it most most helpful is being able to, you know, expand my, my own thinking, my own, uh, you know, uh, horizons or beyond that. Have you delved much into the, the concept of, of meta skills? No, I haven't. So, so meta skills, are basically the skills behind the skills, right? So, um, mm -hmm. if you want to become a better salesperson, you know, don't spend time reading sales books, read time, uh, spend time, building skills and the stuff that sits behind. So learning how to write better, learning how to communicate better, you know, they, they are the skills that have multiple skills associated with them, right? Yeah, so mm -hmm. writing is a meta skill, you know, um, or how to write better is a, a meta skill and those sorts of things. But I've not done it yet, but that's why I see AI as useful is, you know, um, these are skills I'm looking to improve, you know, what meta skills sit behind those that could potentially apply to all of these skills and save me a load of time and effort and then increase my my uh, path to or increase my speed to assuming those those skills. Right. So it's, it's something that I'm yet to type into chat GPT. Have you used perplexity yet? No, I have not use it. Uh, yeah, P E R P L E X I T Y. Um, it uses, I believe, OpenAI. You can switch on Copilot to enhance responses, mm -hmm. but it's a search and research platform. And I'd, I'd heavily recommend that anybody who's a, a Google searcher or Bing search, and I know you've got Bing Chat now built into to Bing Search, so I guess there's there's a crossover. But the thing that I like about Perplexity is um, you can refine by topic matter. So mm. you can say, um, and I know you can do this in, in Google as well, um, but you can say, um, I'm only interested in academic articles. So you, you switch your, your topic matter to academic articles. The one that I use, though, is search Reddit. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Reddit, I find it's so much more raw and genuine because it's it's people. It's yeah. peer reviewed. You know, it, it self-corrects. You know, somebody mm -hmm. says something wrong on Reddit, you know, and you've got, <laughs> you'll, you'll hear, oh, you'll, you'll, you'll know. Yeah, you've yeah, got a yeah. hundred other people saying that that's bullshit. Like what, what you're saying yeah. there, do you see what I mean? So I find being able to have quick, quick access to those conversation topics is really useful because you can get to the root of, and can't always guarantee that it is the truth, but you can get to the root of subject matter really quickly by searching through Reddit compared to what might be an AI generated blog post on Google? Because there's a lot of yep. them now, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. And 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 that's and so, you know, and maybe that was the you know, when you asked me like technology, I think 
I often point to time savings and all of these these other elements. But if you ask me what I what I enjoy most is, I think uh, I, I I firmly believe in like lifelong learning. Yes. Um, and so I think the opportunity to use you know uh, AI tools and to use tools like ChatGPT to at least get a base understanding where I can then take it away. Right. I don't, I don't ever want to go on and, and be like teach. You know, I, I want to take what are the fundamental key components. And then from there, I can then take that away and explore further and dive further into other areas that, that I want to. But it, it helps me to provide me with at least, um, you know, a base understanding and an understanding of where, where else I, I need to go to expand my horizons there. And so I think, I think that's, you know, an opportunity my parents didn't get, other, you know, uh, other generations didn't get. And it's one that, you know, uh, our generations getting my kids will, will have the opportunity to get is, is to utilize technology to, to expand those, those horizons and expand their learnings and understanding of the world. But there's a, and I know you said it's obviously more than just, you know, time savings and productivity, but there's, there is no better time saving than knowing how to make the right decisions, yeah. you know? Um, and we, we spoke about this, you know, earlier from, um, you know, talking about health and, you know, all, all, all of that sort of stuff is, you know, one decision on how you can improve your health could create more time for you by adding two years to, to your life. Right. You know, so we, we can create time in the decisions that we make now, or we can save time in having the wisdom to be able to make the correct decisions that mean that we don't end up going down that rabbit hole. And that's what I'm guilty of. Right. You know, I could do a better mm -hmm. job at not just jumping in headfirst into stuff. You know, if, if I had a bit more wisdom, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to say, yeah, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to do that. There's no better way to save time than being incredibly selective about the stuff that you do and don't do. I, I agree with that. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and I mean, that's, that's one of the things with, with Kaleno, that's one of the things we also, you know, really emphasize with, with our platform for, for our clients is, is being able to give that, that time back so that they can really focus on, you know, the higher value elements that, that they, they need to focus on for their business. Because as I said, the roles evolve, the challenges have evolved, and it's how do you meet that and how can automation help give you the time and, and empower you to do that. Well, that full circle. That was good. There we go. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> the only last um, question before you can tell people where to find out more about you and, and Clano is, I know you've mentioned where technology has helped you and you mentioned ChatGPT there, but have you got like a, an app on your phone or like a Google Chrome extension or, or a gadget? So like I've got Fitbits and, you know, all that sort of stuff that you just you just couldn't live without either in your personal or professional life. Ooh. An app on my phone. There's so many. I'm trying to actually go through and pick one. You're visualizing the screen in your in your mind. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is that is a great question, and that's because I've become so dependent on my phone and so dependent on on a variety of different different apps. Um, I would say. Uh, that the the one app that I continuously you know go to uh, to look at and um, to try and, and gain uh, insights on is um, I'm kind of now caught between two. You can say two. Okay. Uh, so I would say that. Um, Fitbit is definitely one, yeah. um, because one thing, especially having kids now, I'm really much more focused on health yeah. um, and, and trying to, to keep and, and evaluate that. Uh, I would say that the other one that I, I am, you know, quite always um, plugged into is uh, is probably more boring, and that is like my my Kobo, uh, just to be able to like go through, and I, I love to read, and so being able to like go through and take a look at like content and like some of my books and stuff like that and Kobo. understand. Yeah. It's just like, a, it's just a, Kobo is just like an Amazon Kindle. You not have that in the UK? No. So it's basically like a Kindle, but you can get your books and stuff like that. But if I'm taking a look at like my apps and stuff, uh, we use that, but let me, let me give you a, uh... what's the difference between a Kobo and a Kindle? A Kobo is it's basically the same. It's where you can purchase books, you can go through and, and things like that. Actually, you know what it is? 
can I take that back and we can do some editing on this? Yes, but it's going, yeah. to be, it's going to be Blinklist. Ah, yes. Yeah, no Blinklist, yeah. And I think that, again, goes to the lifelong learning. Um, I use it often when I'm trying to go through and get a basic understanding of a concept. And sometimes I don't have time to go through, you know, a whole bunch of things. So I'll, I'll jump on Blinklist and, and try to download it within like the next 15, 20 minutes and then, you know, expand out from there. I, I, so let me, yeah. let me say that. So I would say Fitbit from the health perspective is definitely a key one. Yeah. Uh, Blinklist is probably the the second one, and I know they're they're not exactly the uh, you know uh, most thrilling of uh, of uh, of apps, but uh, but they're just the ones my go tos. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we need to edit. Like, I, I, I think it's it's fine. People now know that Kobo's exist, including me. Uh, yeah, there we go. So it's Kobo's. Yeah, I use Kobo's and I use Kindles too. So yeah, there we go. Right, so we got we got three. You know, um, t- t- I'll let you off the hook. Um, but but <laughs> technically, it's, it's fine. Um, but that's the you know you've got a gadget and you've got um, a learning app and then you've got a fitness app. So that so, they, they so here's here's my question to you: What's yours? Like a like an app or yeah? Anything? If you if I was to flip the question over to you, what would be the one thing? I've only been asked. So there's only been one other guest that has asked me that. Um, I can't remember what it was at the time. Um, but my problem is I use so many, um, it's difficult. So I'm, I'm going to say, right. I'm going to say one that a podcast guest hasn't given because I've, I've actually got two that really helped me recently. So, Mm -hmm. so the one that I won't talk about too much is motion, which is an AI calendar Mm -hmm. scheduling app. And we had Chris Riley, who's Mm -hmm. um, really great interview that that we had. He's an absolute financial modeling pro. Um, So he runs his own business. So uh, motion really helps him. And and then Simon Devine from Hopton analytics, they both mentioned motion, but for me, it's spark, Mm -hmm. which is a, is a mail app. So, so mm-hmm. I've got maybe four four different e- email addresses. Um, ah, so it helps to console uh, put, put gotcha. them all together. But, yeah, but that's that's not the main advantage. So um, similar to similar to Google, because you know you can do the 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 view in Google whereby you've got um, like the promotions tab and the, the whatever, and it does that categorization for you. I guess similar to Outlook when you've got just your normal inbox and your focused inbox, where it tries to do that mm-hmm. categorization uh, categorization for you. It takes that a step further. So you've got your personal inbox, which is the one-to-one communications. You've got notifications category, which is really mm-hmm. useful. Yeah. So if um, anything relating to like, a, I don't know, an update. Um, so for example, I used HubSpot quite a lot. So the HubSpot updates when somebody's tagged me in a task or something like that, that goes into the notifications. Then got a newsletter section, which is mm. also really helpful because I can just let the numbers build. Like, yeah. So technically, I can zero my inbox for everything except newsletters, and then I can just do like a newsletter batch. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't get it right, you know. Um, but you can you can change the category. So if if you get a new what it thinks is a newsletter that is actually a notification, you can you can switch it across, which, which is absolutely fine. What they've started doing recently, again, I haven't I haven't used it yet, but they've started adding Gen I Gen AI into that application as well. Mm, yeah. So for example, and, and this, so I will slightly step back on my previous statement where I said, I'm categorically against using AI to send emails for me, which I am. I don't want AI to send emails for me, but I'm not adverse to AI making suggestions for me on how I can improve my communication. Yeah. And I think that's where some of the stuff in Spark is useful because it's got like a set of auto prompts. So if I just reply to, I've got uh, our email thread up here as well. Um, yeah. I click on the, the AI part of this. Um, if I'm starting to type, I can say stuff like shorten, for example, you know, so, so, so if I get to the point where I'm writing war and peace, which, which is quite frequent, right? I've got like three, a four pages of email response. I could say shorten and it will help try and get some of the filler out of it. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So, so that's quite useful. And maybe an example of a company that's getting it right. Um, mm-hmm. It does do the like 
generate an automatic reply, which I don't use, but there are use cases past uh, getting it to do everything for you. So again, read a long description, but Spark Mail is really useful. Um, there's a ton of others. I think there, there's a Newton Mail app. See, those those answers are, are 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 so much more thrilling than the ones that I that I just gave you. I gave you some some more old school ones. I gave you you know, but it's, but it's uh, email. That, it's like, focused on you know, uh, most like health and learning. I think are those are the 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 two that I I, I would say I use most frequently on my uh, on my phone. Emails aren't and sexy. It, like sorry emails aren't sexy Le learning like <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of blinkist right you know yeah. if somebody says to me i can read a book in 15 minutes yeah, yeah. i'm i'm into that right and and i, I did yeah. used to use blinkist um and actually and i don't know whether you found, found the same right but um i'd consume a lot of base knowledge from blinkist Mm. And then I'd find that I missed the experience of reading the whole book. Yeah. But what I then did is I thought, right, well, Blinkage does, Blinkist doesn't cost much. So, so I used it actually as a filter for the books that I wanted to buy versus the books that I didn't want to buy. So anything yeah, that, that I really enjoyed. exactly on. what I do. Yeah. I, I don't use it as a replacement. I use it as a, I want to learn, I want to dive into deeper. And then from there, I'll be like, this is the right, like sometimes I'll take a, I'll, I'll you know, take any topic. I'll go through, I'll find five or six books on it. I'll throw in, you know, a few blink lists and then I'll be like, no, this one is really the one that's hitting the points that I really want to dive into. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's what I use it for is really to help me hone into what it is that I really want to get to know and, and understand better. Yeah. And what's it, is, what is it like $8 a month, $15 a month? Yeah, yeah. It's not expensive, but yeah, it's not, uh, it's not at all. So, but it's, it's great. I, I, I enjoy it. Yeah. And, and I def definitely recommend it. Definitely recommend it. Having used it in the past, as I say, it's just, you know, I, I just decided to, you know, um, audio books, podcasts, and Kindle um, were my preferred medium. I'd, I do keep seeing it come up and wanting to go back to it because I think, oh, you know, I could I could be absorbing so much more, but then coming back to the being bombarded with information all the time, yeah. I think I'll I'll pick my battles and stick That's to the cool. current tech stack, right? With with my sexy Spark mail app. <laughs> no, no. So now, so now here's my my final question for you. Did those two guitars behind you, oh, yeah. did you select those purposefully because today's the 31st, you have an orange and a black, the Halloween theme, you were, you were just jumping on it as, uh, as we go through. <laughs> Cause I, I, I noticed that just now. And I said, Oh, you're, you're, you're well prepared. No, or orange is my favorite color. Amazing. Um, and I don't think I've ever mentioned this on the podcast actually, but if you see my content, um, whether it's um, the teaser video captions with the the podcast, or whether it's one of the the swipe files or whatever, the highlight is always orange. That is true. I noticed that. Yeah, uh, and I remember. Ah, oh, interesting. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the the the, the brand um, Tech for Finance actually is um, started off as a supporting brand for for the day job, which I, I kind of it kind of it does um, still because they're they're linked, you know, ERP and tech for finance, obviously that they, they play in the same space, right? Um, but kind of morphed more than that. So it used to be kind of like gold and, and blue, but now it's or it's orange and blue, just because I thought, right, well, I just want to have my favorite color on my post. That's that's how it was. So yeah, that's that's the reason for the orange sparkly one. Um gotcha. the other one, and the paint job isn't what it once was, so the sticker on it um that's peeling off now, that's um an Iron Maiden VIP tour sticker from the year that I was born. Ooh. So that that was from my dad. It used to be on another guitar um, that I'm selling yeah. because I've got like eight guitars and, you know, a kid can probably get a ton more value from that guitar than, than I ever was. So I, peel, I peeled it off a bit. It's lost some of its stickiness, but it's covering up a big scratch on that guitar. But it's actually, uh, you can't see it on camera, but it's actually a pearlescent color. Mm -hmm. ah, okay. so, so it morphs from purple to green in the right light it's not interesting incredible. okay okay so it's the it's the lighting okay great because i saw i saw that and i was like oh you, you uh, you know you jumped ahead and and uh, already did the theme for today or already prepped no, no that's prepped. It. so, so that's, <laughs> that's that's the reason for those so orange sparkling pearlescent but no they um they're made by a guy called um dave grohlman g-o-g-r-o-l-l-m-a-n i don't know whether he's still selling them grohlman guitar so i, I met him with my dad um, I think when I was 14 at the London Guitar Show, mm -hmm. um, we went a couple of years in a row. 
And I remember looking at the guitars and thinking, they look absolutely amazing, like quirky. And you can't see the, I don't think you can see the headstock. They've got quite what's called an inverted headstock on them. So, so it points, mm -hmm. the headstock points upwards, you know, ah. um, so they're, they're quite, they're quite quirky, but I absolutely love them. So I played a version of that palescent one. Um, and basically said, can I have it? And, and dad phoned mum up to see whether she'd give approval on the, the budget for the large guitar expense. And it was a no at the, at the show. Um, mm -hmm. And I kind of forgot about it. But then uh, 15th birthday came around and that was, the, that, was, that was the gift. So it's got treble 015 on the headstock, which marks my 15th birthday. Mm -hmm. And then um, I kind of knew about that. Um, because I think paper round money did contribute a little bit to that one. Um, yeah. but the orange one was a total surprise. So that, that was my 18th birthday. Um, but, that's amazing. but they're totally different setups. So the, uh, the pearlescent one has got what's called a, a hard bridge. Mm -hmm. Um, so ba basically means that the bridge doesn't flex, which gives like a really, um, gritty, like, um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of tension there. And you can yeah. use a really thick string. So when you're doing your, your metal, um, you know, it makes, yeah. makes a good noise. The orange one is like a totally different guitar. So it's the same style, but the pickups are different. So it makes a completely different yeah. sound. And the, the bridge moves. So I don't know whether you've ever heard a guitar solo where there's a lot of you know, yeah. that sort of stuff. That's where the flexible bridge comes from. It's called a Floyd Rose. So uh, that okay. bridge is why it extends further down because it actually floats. So yeah, they're, they're, both, they're both gifts I've got. Or by the amp, there's more in the loft. Oh, I see. That. I see that. I, I have to admit, I, I, I'm only good at the triangle and uh, aspiring cowbell. <laughs> that's, uh, that's you might be a good drummer. Drums are easy to, to take. There we go. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. So yeah. No. Uh, th thank, thanks for the questions. I, I, get, I rarely get asked questions, so it's it's nice to, well, Amazing. when I'm hosting a podcast, obviously I can talk volumes when I'm guesting on webinars but yeah not not many people take that interest so thanks for that but yeah so so let's let's finish there we've gone way over time so so apologies yeah. but where can people find more about you and kalena yeah so if uh, if people would uh you know uh like to uh, reach out you know feel free to reach out on on linkedin uh, you'll find me um, on uh, on LinkedIn, and uh, also please do check us out at www.kaleno.com. Uh, you know, and uh, and have a look, and, and please feel free to reach out directly if you have any questions, uh, anything like that. Um, you know, uh, welcome uh, invites to LinkedIn and uh, and uh, any kind of chats uh, through there. Yeah. So we'll put that in the show notes so people got a direct link for people that can't pick up the, the show notes. Um, it's Gibran spelled D J I. B R A N E. Yes. And then I don't know whether I pronounced it right in the intro. Is it, is it Larabur? Is that how you La, Larabur? Yes. Uh, L A R R A B U R E. Fine. Cool. So yeah, hook up with, uh, with Gibran on LinkedIn and, uh, yeah, have, have a chat, but no, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure and really appreciate you taking the time. I think it's been a good conversation. So yeah, maybe, Same here. maybe we do a round two at some point, but uh, no, thanks for taking the time. That sounds good. Thanks a lot, Adam. Really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone. No worries. Thanks.